Okay, so I think the next speaker uh, introduces himself. Um, I'm Lukas Stadler, working for Oracle Labs uh, from Austria. Um, and I'll be talking a bit about uh, what's happening in FASTAR. Um, it's going to be a bit of a random assortment of topics, but I hope it's interesting and helpful anyway. Uh, if you have questions, as always, feel free to interrupt me. Of course, I'm not making any statements that are legally binding. So I, I'm going to start with a short introduction and motivation. Um, so there's, there's a multitude of programming languages. So there, and all these programming languages, they have their own reason for being. They're, they're, why were they created? Uh, for which purpose were they created? And, and this underlying motivation, it, it manifests in, in the programming language concepts of these languages. It manifests in, in the characteristics of their implementation. Like, do they have a garbage collector? How is the garbage collector implemented? Uh, are they compiled to bytecode, native code? Uh, what does the interface to native code look like? And, and the motivation of the languages, it also manifests in, in how the community across, uh, around these languages is built. And that also means that they're kind of separate. Each one goes through its own development cycles. So uh, there's improvements, uh, better GCs, uh, we're adding compilers, uh, we are adding new interfaces to other languages, and we're kind of doing this over and over again for every language, basically. And this is where uh, the so-called Truffle framework comes in. It's a, uh, a framework developed by Oracle Labs, um, and it's like an operating system for programming languages. So it, it's based on uh, a JVM itself, so all of this is running on a, on a Java virtual machine, and the, the Java virtual machine, it already gives you things like garbage collection and, and security services and so on. And then on top of that, the Truffle framework, it, it does more for you. Like it, it worries about where are the sources, uh, interoperability between languages, debugging services, uh, all kinds of things, optimizations on top of it. And this is what we would like to leverage and what we do leverage with FastR. It's an open source implementation based on Truffle, which is also open source. Um, you might ask why R or not. It's not really a question that I need to convince people uh, here to use R. Uh, but from an implementation point of view, it's an interesting language because it's a complicated language. So if you can efficiently execute R on such a framework, then you can do any other language, basically. Like, you're laughing at puny languages like JavaScript or so. So it's, it's kind of, we choose to implement R, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And do the other things. And what makes it so hard? So one thing is the native interface. Um, but I'm not going to talk so much about that here. The other thing is um, because there are so many abstractions in the language. And uh, Alex already uh, talked a bit about this. So there's this, if you see a simple expression like the one on the top, then what the system wants to see is like the expression tree uh, on the right. But there's so many steps in between in order to get there. Like, uh, what are the types? What are the classes? Uh, are these objects S4 objects? Then do the, the basic operations resolve to the basic operations? Uh, and then if there is a class, then you have all these different methods that you need to look up. Um, and all of this can change, basically, all the time. And then you need to take care of intermediate results, of course. Uh, you don't want to create new vectors at every step. Uh, 
it's a function, so when you enter it, you could go, you could fall into debugging. Um, and then there's also the thing about the visibility of the results, so you need to carry along this bit. And basically an, an efficient R runtime needs to remove all those abstractions. And that's, that's kind of the basic theme behind all of what we do. We try to look beyond the abstractions to extract the real problems. Um, yeah, and then with that motivation, I'd like to enter into the actual topic. So one thing that's, since we are in such a polyglot system, uh, is very important, is interoperability with other languages. Um, and then the Truffle framework has a very fundamental approach to that, so each language can describe its objects and provide primitive operations to access its objects. And one thing that changed uh, in the last year is how we deal with uh, Java. So uh, Fastar has its own Java interface. You can access Java objects, create new ones. Uh, it works like you would expect it. And uh, it, it works with the normal dollar operator and, and assignments and everything. And here, what it also does is it, it returns a map um, from this function, and then it's represented as a list-like object uh, in our code. We also, we're also working on a compatibility layer for our Java, because that's how people at the moment access Java code. But that can be built on top of the, the built-in operations. And those operations are very efficient, so it works well. And it's, uh, it's, it's also about the symmetry. So um, when you access uh, JavaScript objects, it should just work the same way. Uh, you should be able to interoperate with JavaScript, get a JavaScript object and treat it like any other object and, and access properties and so on. And when you, I mean, interoperability for us, for us is also about interoperability with existing code, with native code and so on. So it's, it also has this um, compatibility aspect. And, and of course, it's interesting because we want to make packages work. And in order to install and load and run a package, a system really needs to have uh, a significant level of completeness because there are so many pieces involved there. So it, it seems like uh, you need to have a, a file system layout that's similar to R because it's packages when they are installed they can reference stuff in there. They, they, they use certain directories to put things in there. They use certain scripts uh, that they are executing during their installation or configuration files uh, for compiling native code and so on. So you need to be very similar to the original one. And then um, once you start testing all kinds of packages, you really see all the corner cases of the language. So every, every last uh, behavior in, in terms of when which argument is evaluated or uh, we need this there's many functions which are documented as this is not reliable, you shouldn't use it to make actual program code, but they are used anyway. So it's, it's kind of, the specification says you're free to change it, but in reality you need to behave like the original R implementation. And then, um, yeah, there's the native API itself, um, and that of course has many assumptions about the underlying system, like uh, a non-moving, non-concurrent garbage collector. Uh, it, it's inherently single-threaded. It's really a, uh, its own specification of how the system should behave. And we've come quite a long way there. Um, I'd like to show just a short Demo. The screen is 
So fast R is like any other R interpreter. And uh, I'm going to use a small example using RCPP. <coughs> Command line completion is actually quite funny because it's just an R function that you can call, so it's very convenient to implement. And um, I have a this, this calculates some mutual information on a vector. So it's an R function, it takes a while. Yeah, and of course it makes sense to to use a CPP version of it. Plus version is uh, much faster, but actually, I mean, this is kind of what FastR is all about. Uh, it's a system that adapts to your usage and it compiles in the background. So once you've used that method a couple of times, uh, it's actually going to get faster. It, it, it doesn't reach the C++ performance in this example just yet, but we, we're going to get there. Okay, and it, I mean, we don't pass all the tests on RCPP yet, but a significant portion, um, so which kind of proves that it's possible. Um, there's one small unconnected topic that I'd like to show you. This is our uh, verification of built-ins. So we, R has lots and lots of built-ins. Uh, functions that implement some intrinsic functionality. There's like, I think, 700 of them or so. And uh, they all do something with their arguments and cast them in specific ways and so on. And we decided to, to create a declarative style for this, which basically says, okay, the argument with the name x, it must be a string, um, and we're going to take this string vector and extract its first element. So we, we get a scalar string. And uh, there's also, I mean, you can't just say uh, without the must be string value, then it's going to be coerced to a string value. And it has a defined behavior on, like when there is no element, uh, what's it going to do? Is it going to give you an A and so on? And Together with the way in which these built-ins are implemented, uh, we can actually statically analyze them and see if we deal with all argument combinations. So this is a, a very uh, interesting way, I think, to specify this behavior in terms of arguments. Um, there's built-in debugging functionality. Uh, and let me quickly show you how this works. Uh, it's currently implemented for the NetBeans uh, IDE. And this uses our Java interface. It's a bit unfortunate. It, this interface is redesigned as we speak, so uh, a few weeks from now it's going to look different. And therefore I'm not going to go into much detail on how it, it works, but it's we're in Java code here, and I can step in this Java code, and it executes some R code. Yeah. And I can also step into it here, and I end up in, in the R file, uh, where I'm debugging my R code. Uh, you can ex actually see like the, the environment here, uh, the enclosing environments. So I mean, these things, they are promises that are not evaluated yet. And I, of course, I can set breakpoints like in, on a specific line and I end up in there and 
can take a look at the. Uh, so now it's not evaluated yet. I do another stop. Now it's evaluated this promise. So this is this is not based on the R internal debugging functionality, like the debug function and so on. Uh, this is based on this uh, AST level instrumentation that we can support through the Truffle framework. So th this also means that it works for all the languages that are taking part in this. Um, what's actually interesting is that we can also uh, run LLVM bit code in this system, so we can execute native code in the same way, so you can debug into your native code. Um, it's not the debugging information of the native LLVM bit code at the moment tells you LLVM bit code position, so it's not really useful. Uh, but once this is implemented on as a source level uh, debugging information, you can step like from Java to R and into the native code that you're using, which I think is quite amazing. Okay. Another topic where we made quite some progress, I think, um, is graphics. So we would like to use uh, we would like people to be able to use graphics with FastR because it's one of the great strengths of the R system. And there's, well, the graphics is a complicated thing, so um, you need to have some special handling uh, if you're not R itself. If you are an alternative implementation and you have changed something in the system, you are not going to be able to easily reuse the graphics code. So, I mean, then it's it's a yeah. You have the, the graphics package and the GR devices package, and and I mean that there's a big red arrow from the GR devices to the R runtime because there's a lot of dependencies there. And um, actually, lots of interesting graphics code uses it through another package, the grid package. And uh, we did actually quite some prototypes and quite some experiments there. And uh, I mean, we, we tried really a low level re implementation of the GR devices and graphics um, in Java. That didn't work so well. Uh, then we tried um, using the native code for these two packages and introducing everything in the native interface that we need for that. But then that's, they are very connected uh, to the runtime. And what we actually ended up with is a more high-level interface uh, that's built on Grid. Because Grid is very useful, it's, a, it's an R-level interface, uh, it has useful primitives like lines and polygons and colors and everything. So that's what we went with in the end. And um, we intercept those grid calls. You can, it's, it's just a Java interface that gives you all these primitives. You can draw on an arbitrary Java graphics device, so you can use it in your own applications like that. Uh, or you can export SVGs and so on. Um, and uh, I'd like to do another quick demo if I have the time. <laughs> So uh, it's a Java application, so the first time you do something, it's going to take a bit of time uh, because it's loading lots of stuff. But as you can see, I mean, lot, again, not everything works yet uh, from ggplot, but a lot of stuff does. Uh, and you can actually do interesting things with this. Uh, one of the components in this uh, Graal, in this bigger truffle system, is uh, a Node.js implementation. So we have 
we have examples where we have Node.js applications that use R to create SVG graphics and that they dynamically deliver um, to a user. And that is very convenient to do. Okay, and that already means that I'm almost at the end uh, of this talk. <laughs> I, I, I had to laugh when I saw this ranging package because we have something similar um, that you can download from our GitHub repository. Uh, it's called Gradium because this, this bigger thing that contains all the languages, it's called Gradium. So you, you install this package in some R interpreter and uh, point it to the directory with the Gradium binary, which you can download from the Oracle Technology Network. And you can also look at the sources, of course. And then you can decide whether you want to run code locally on your existing R or whether you uh, send it on uh, to this agent that's running faster. And it's, it's an interesting implementation because it's actually using Node.js again uh, to create the server because Node.js is quite uh, convenient for these things. And then it's communicating over JSON uh, with this uh, Node.js server. Okay, and I, I, that's it. Thanks for the attention. <laughs>